I was just saying uh, before, I mean, I'll say it again so you can hear, obviously, but I loved the film. Yeah. I'm sure you've heard that a lot from a lot of people, but it was, I, I mean, yeah, that, that, that was, I'm not to give away too much, but there was about two or three moments towards the end that I definitely shed a few tears and I laughed a lot. Oh, it was just wonderful. Well done. <laughs> oh, great. Oh, amazing. I'm, good. I'm glad to hear it, man. Thanks, Stefan. That's, that's really nice. Um, so I'm going to begin, I mean, starting by, I mean, it is such a profound movie and it's enriched by the kind of sadness and the pertinence that runs through it. And yet, obviously, has these kind of moments of, of comedy. Yeah, I mean, when you got that screenplay, you must have just looked at that and looked at the character and just thought, this is one I have to be a part of. Yeah, 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 absolutely, man. I think I've said this a million times now and people are going to think it's one of those things that, you know, that the actors say. But it, I mean, it, it, it just really was. It, it, the script came to me through through my agent, Sarah Sedev at Core Management. Um, and, and you know, the, the guys at Colleen Crawford uh, casting agency, Danny Jackson, were really kind enough to give me the opportunity to read in for it. Um, and it was just beautiful man um from from the first few pages i was laughing and and i really didn't want to put put this 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 screenplay down um and then by the end of it i was i was saying to my wife um man i've got to do whatever i can to to do this because this is something special yeah was it funny on the page? Because it feels like one of those movies that on the page reads like a drama, but then it's, it's the kind of, it's the it's the pacing of the movie, isn't it? It's the kind of, it's the way Ben uses the camera and the kind of way, it's that, that kind of Wes Anderson-y type approach to everyone's staging and stuff that I think enhanced the comedic effect. But when you were actually reading it, did it did it read like a comedy at all? Yeah, 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 100%. I think that's one of the, the real beauties of it was there were some really beautiful comedic elements already on the page. Um, and and that was part of the intrigue as to to see what what Ben was going to do to to bring this to life. Um, I mean, just that just that initial scene with with Helga and Boris, you know, that it reads it's 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 just hilarious. Um, and and then those sort of those quibbles between between the two brothers Wasif and Abedi, and um, and and just elements of of kind of Farhad's approach to life was was just really endearing man yeah yeah the co comedy the answer to your question the comedy was definitely there in the, on the page and i'm assuming looking at you now that that would have been that was a real moustache that you were sporting in the movie and <laughs> were you tempted to keep it after uh after, after you guys finished shooting um yeah i mean it it was it was definitely my moustache um and and i i did keep it for a little while i think when i came back uh it was just it was just something different, something nice to kind of sport for a little while. And I think I came back around the time of of November. So I kept it through November. You had a head start. <laughs> yeah, 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 I was already a little ahead of the game there. Um, how was it shooting in, in Scotland? Because I mean, it's, it's one of those countries where I think obviously as when I was sort of growing up, I, would, I knew it, I knew it for Glasgow, Edinburgh, and I had sort of, sort of family that lived on there. But the sort of older I've got, and I've now married into a Scottish family, and the, the highlands and the islands and stuff, it's one of the most beautiful places in, in the world, isn't it? It's so kind of picturesque. I mean, how, how was it kind of being in that, in that environment? Um, yeah, I mean, all of the above. It's it's such a, a sort of a fantastical, a magical part of the world. You know, you can you can well imagine filming things that are fantasy based in in this kind of world. And and some you know there are some sort of magical realism sort of parts of, of our film as well. Um, and and the kind of the beauty of the landscape is. It's just breathtaking. Um, with Uist, what was quite interesting is that there are parts of Uist that you know you think you were in in New Zealand or or you know in um, sort of some of the scenes from like Lord of the Rings. Um, but then what where where I think Ben chose to shoot almost had this kind of purgatorial sort of almost uh, bleak sort of feel about it you know because it's just flat there aren't any trees anywhere and it just seems to go go on forever and ever um so it was i mean i think uist is such a such a gem and such a character in itself in in the film um but it, yeah uh, again to answer your question in short it's such a beautiful part of the world yeah man 
Yeah, yeah, you're right, because I guess it is kind of, it's supposed to feel quite, at times, a little bit kind of bleak. But I, I maybe it's just because I've been locked down for so long, just seeing all that grass and that open space just made me want to run out into it. But um, I was really interested in the camaraderie on set, because obviously there's a kind of collective of characters characters here. And obviously, just, just by proxy of having that many people in one room with, from different backgrounds, you have lots of people with lots of different stories. Was, was it was it quite, it must have been quite um, engaging and enlightening being ar around so many other actors with, with different sort of stories to tell? Yeah, yeah, hundred percent. I mean, we we got on really well from from when we were rehearsing up in Edinburgh. Um, myself and Amir, who'd already met before, but then we met uh, Kobana Ansa and Ola 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 Orabi, um, who also came along. And the four of us, I mean, we hit it off from day one. Um, and and we and and Ben had put together an amazing crew as well. So the there was always just quite a nice atmosphere on set morale was always quite high and you need that especially in a place like Uist where the weather can turn on the sixpence man you you could be you could be in the middle of you know summer one minute and then it's gale force winds and hail so it was it was much needed to have that kind of team uh to be able to get get through some of the tougher elements and to enjoy the, the better ones did you uh, did you speak to many sort of refugees or, or, or have the chance to <laughs> learn of other people's stories and, and and kind of and other people's backgrounds to help kind of enrich and, and inform your character? Yeah, we did. Um, ben and our production team had put us in touch with um, some people. Well, we met with uh, a community of uh, um, of men who had who had received refugee status uh, up in Edinburgh. Um, and they were kind enough to share some of their stories and, and just sort of chat with us. And, you know, these, the, the, I think the thing about our film is, is to not kind of shine a light on a, on a crisis, but more about these human beings' experiences. And that was, it was definitely something we felt in the room when we were speaking to, to these men who, I, don't, I mean, I don't speak Arabic myself, but you get a sense of the, the energy and the kind of the, the camaraderie between these people in this, this newfound community. Um, and then Ben had also put me in touch with the Afghan society in London, um, who were also, you know, uh, so, so gracious with their time. And, and I spoke with them um, and yeah, I must've spent maybe, I think about a month back and forth speaking to them and learning about their experiences as well. Yeah, because like you said, it's, it's what's so good about this. It gives every character a story, doesn't it? I mean, it's something we so often forget. I think that with with anything like this and with, with kind of global crises as, as it has been of, in recent years is that it, you forget that people are not, it's not statistics. Every single person has their own story. And that was what made Limbo so great. Did that Was that that was that one of the reasons, well, part of the appeals to you, I guess, was that it just felt so idiosyncratic when it came to every character's own unique situation. Yeah, yeah, 100%. I mean, you know, um, I think the main thing for me in this story was was that I got to feel like this was uh, a fully rounded character and although not a lot of, of Farhad's story comes out um, there was enough in the script for me to feel like this isn't just kind of a, a token character in a story and it's not just a statistic it's um, you know, oftentimes these these stories are told in a way where we're kind of beaten with a Bible over the head about how terrible these things are, um, and that's that's not what what was happening in in this, which was which was definitely the uh, part of the appeal, yeah. Yeah, and I mean, it sounds like a sort of big question, probably a hard one to answer, but look to watching this and kind of appreciating everyone's kind of story and taking such an empathetic view. It, it really makes you realise that this kind of lack of, of compassion generally in, in, in culture at the moment, particularly if you look at kind of US and UK as examples, the kind of the, the, the closing of borders, this, this kind of reluctance to help people that are in desperate need of help. The, does it ever sort of surprise you or shock you just at how little compassion sometimes that we, we tend to have as a in humanity? I mean, obviously, that for every one, one bad egg, there's 10 people that would do anything to help. But over the last few years, we have seen a rise in kind of this kind of more closed off sort of introspective way that everyone's sort of saying, no, we don't want people to come to our country, but actually we should be doing all we can to help. Yeah, I think I think you're absolutely right. Um, I think we're in a very strange time at the moment where um, where the voice of 
of people who 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 I guess perhaps I don't want to say lack compassion because it would be dismissive of their experiences as well. I think um, I think key to to a time like this is to have some kind of empathy to be able to navigate through it and come out on the other side better, so that we're able to understand both both kind of sides of of the situation. But um, you know, we I mean, just like if we're talking right right up to date with with the situation in Israel and Palestine and what's going on right over there right now, it's it's horrific. I mean, these you know, these are war crimes and we're waiting on the the international world to, to speak up. And and what we are seeing in in sort of uh, to echo what you said is that for every one person that's that's voicing an opinion that thinks that these sorts of atrocities are OK, there are tens of people who are calling out um, and saying that this this just cannot go on. Um, and and I think that's that's something that we as humanity are currently with great difficulty trying to navigate yeah it's it's a it's a tough time man but you know i still have hope i think we're we're going to come out of it at some stage for the better yeah i was, I was having a look at your your sort of for your twitter account i see obviously you've, you've been you share kind of um sort of articles and kind of did you sort of uh, happy to kind of uh, uh, let put your voice to, to kind of things you believe in and because obviously there's this kind of line this kind of really stupid line where people say oh you know actors should stay out of politics but actually, that's an inane statement isn't it because uh, do you think it's important that everyone uses their voice and, and as, as anyone would you know in the same way that if you work in a coffee shop if you're a plumber you have every right to voice your politics in the same way actors do so are you are you very much a supporter of the idea that actors or, or anyone from any walk of life should be political um i'm not sure that it's a case of of being political per se um i think that you know as i guess if your notoriety rises um you have a bigger platform and if you feel partic- a particular way about an issue and you think that you can shine a light on an issue uh, for its betterment, then sure, why not? Um, you know, you're, you're only trying to, trying to make the world a better place. So I don't, I don't think there's anything wrong with that. Um, yeah. Yeah. And I was, I was wanting to looking into your sort of background because I was looking at your your IMDb and sort of you've been doing this it's well kind of sort of on screen sort of credits for sort of seven eight years. Uh, what, what, mm-hmm. what was tell me about like how you got into acting and 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 what your kind of trajectory was and to get you to to where you are today. Um, so I think I've I've always wanted to be an actor I guess uh, before I even knew it um, you know from the age of about four or five years old doing school little school plays and things. Um, and then being given more opportunities by maybe teachers or people people in the community who thought, oh, you know, he's, he's maybe got something. Um, and, and then uh, I worked with a company in Leicester called Hathi, who, who allowed me to kind of really cut my teeth on stage. And then I worked with some companies in the Midlands, like Women in Theatre and the Playhouse, um, who, again, you know, were invaluable in me being able to continue this sort of path because I didn't do I didn't really do the normal route of going to drama school so I kind of navigated a different way um, came to London uh, I had a couple of agents before I had I met Sarah Sarah said they've got management um, and she's really been the one to to help me get this career to start moving um, open doors that hadn't been opened before, get me into rooms and meet people. And um, for a long time, I'd done a lot of stage and I hadn't done uh, much TV at all until I did BBC Doctors. And then after, I think, and I think that's the kind of, it's a rite of passage in a way, I think, doing BBC Doctors once you've done that. Um, <laughs> you know, if you go, oh, oh, you've done Doctors. Okay, yeah, maybe maybe, maybe we'll, uh, we'll give you a shot. Um, and, and then, you know, loads loads of casting directors have been kind enough to call me into the room um and you know you know what it's like uh, some some gigs you land some gigs you don't 
Uh, do, do you remember when you had that kind of moment when you thought, right, this is it, I am an actor? Because it's not like other professions, isn't it? It's not like, let's say you want to be a doctor. You you go to medical school, you get your doctor's certificate, and then you're a doctor. And someone says, what do you do? You go, well, I'm a doctor. But there's that kind of weird in-between phase, isn't there, for quite a few years of acting, where you might do the occasional advert here or there, or a small part in a play, and kind of slowly building up your resume. And I just wondered, was there a moment that you can remember where you thought, right, this this is it, this is my career, This is this is what I do? No. <laughs> <laughs> ever the fraud, Stefan, ever the fraud. <laughs> um, I mean, yeah, I think I think multiple times, and I, I say that ever the fraud, you know, um, when I when I booked the, the gig going on, on Nightfall, and I remember it was the first big sort of international gig, big name, big show, big stars, I was like, oh man, look at this. I'm, a, I'm an actor, you know, I'm flying to places. Um, and, and then, you know, uh, more, more recently with something like Pandora or, or like Limbo, where you're, where you're given a bit more responsibility. Um, yeah, I, I think you're, you're ever kind of battling with that monster of whether you're a fraud or whether you have the right to call yourself an actor and I feel I feel now you know in my mid-30s I, I definitely feel like if I'm if I'm not an actor now then <laughs> uh yeah you, you, you're gonna be lost mate so yeah I think now is the time when I guess I feel feel pretty uh convicted in being an actor yeah. Although I say, you know, imposter syndrome is, is rife amongst all of us, I think. <laughs> I yeah. think there's this, you know, and I think I think it's very grounding and a uh, thing to have anyway. I think the day you sort of turn up and go, yeah, I'm an actor, it's probably. <laughs> yeah. Hang your boots up, man. Yeah, yeah. Your time's up. <laughs> um, so did you, I was, I was wondering too, because I, um, I was just going back to, to Limbo quickly, because it is one of those films, I, I watched it at home, uh, obviously, at the moment, but I'm desperate to see it in oh. the big screen. Have you had the chance yet to see it with a crowd? I know there was, there was, there was a few chances last season, maybe, for socially distanced screenings and stuff and you must on the second part of that question you must be thrilled it is holding out for a theatrical release because it does feel like a film you want to kind of be in the same room as as many people as, as possible to watch yeah yeah uh, i mean i don't i don't know how i feel about being in the same room as as watching with other people um that's that's quite scary i think because you know or you know at the moment, the film and I and I imagine the film will be well received anyway because it because it has been so far. But it's still it's still very very odd, and I've never done it before until until this. We were we were in we will you know we went to the Zurich Film Festival, um, and I was I was lucky enough to go there, and there were two screenings of it, and I said to Ben that <laughs> I want to see it twice, so I'm gonna go to both, um, and and. Yeah, yeah, I saw it with an audience there, and and it was it was really well received. We had a we had a chap in the audience who was Lebanese, um, who had travelled over from from Lebanon uh, maybe 10, 15 years prior to last year, um, and he was living in living in Zurich, and he and during the question and answer session at the end, he he said he just said sort of thank you for for uh, telling this this story with some integrity and truth and and kind of really uh he really resonated with with the story himself uh which you know those kind of moments are, are gold dust mm. yeah because I, was, I, was, I mean i was wondering too um just going back to talking about looking at the characters of course the lead goes everywhere with that instrument i can't remember what it's called the name of the instrument but then it's an oud an oud. Um, yeah. uh, I just wondered what's the the one object if you were off on your on, on travels that you'd never be able to leave behind. Have you got anything that you'd always have to carry everywhere with you? Oh, that's a good question. Um, more recently, I've taken my climbing climbing boots and and chalk bag with me um, to places because because I've taken up rock climbing and bouldering. And so if I am traveling abroad, I'll, I'll have a look if there's like an indoor climbing place because um, I enjoy that. <laughs> um, uh, but something perhaps a little more interesting than just climbing boots. Uh, I don't know. A good book. Uh, my Xbox. <laughs> uh, yeah, maybe, maybe, maybe a chessboard to play chess with people. Um, Tra travel scrabble is always good I find 
Travel Scrabble. Yeah, Travel Scrabble's great. You can take that anywhere. I mean, it might oh, be that's... hard if you go to places where English isn't their first language because then you're dealing with a different <laughs> different words. So <laughs> that could be an interesting game to play. But no, it's, yeah, that's, I always find that's the good one. Um, and yeah, just to go back as quickly, you're just talking about seeing the film in Zurich and stuff like that. How is it seeing yourself on the big screen? I mean, the thing is, I, I would imagine that it, it, it never gets normal, even if you've been doing this for 50 years. But is it? are you able to sit down and watch Limbo like I would watch it, like an audience member? Or is it too distracting seeing, seeing yourself in, in, as part of the story um yeah i think it's it is a little bit distracting i you know we had about two years apart from when we finished shooting to to when we were able to see it on screen so it gave me a, a little bit of distance to to be able because i you know i didn't look the same anymore um so i could watch it perhaps a little better than than you might do normally um but you know it's you, you're not the only cog in in the whole of the the clockwork piece you know you you're uh, i don't know what the phrase is the cog in the the dude are um <laughs> but yeah i'm not the only piece in in the puzzle and uh, and so you're able to really and there's so much of the film that you're able to enjoy the cinematography the score the the other players on screen um uh just Gosh, I can't think of anything else in in there that now my mind's just gone blank. Um, but just yeah, the landscapes, the the uh, the framing, the the way that kind of the the edit of it as well, and the way all that kind of plays in together. I you know I discovered, which was really nice for the first time. There's a moment where he's uh, Omar is tightening, he's tuning his oud. And the sound starts to become quite eerie and sort of like it's horror. It's kind of like this is sort of almost like a horror film esque. Um, it's kind of really industrial sort of sounds, uh, which was a great experience, you know, as as a consumer. So I yeah, I was able to in a way, but yeah. not so much when I was on screen. <laughs> So my, my final question really is just looking ahead and what's kind of next or what you've, because I guess obviously, you know, sort of pre-Limbo, I guess there was maybe, maybe a sort of sense of waiting for that kind of big kind of cinematic kind of role and that this, I mean, Limbo is is that and then some. So has, has that changed the the kind of your aims and ambitions for like the next 10 years? And how how how, how, how do you think the next few years are, are looking for you? Have you got kind of much lined up? Um. Yeah, I really don't know. I mean, I have done some stuff already. I worked with uh, Amrita Acharya and uh, uh, Priyanka Burford recently on a short film directed by uh, Amrita Acharya and starring um, Pri uh, Priyanka Burford. Um, and uh, I'm and I sh I was in uh, a couple of episodes. I think about three episodes of of the Amazon series Hannah. Um, I'm only in it momentarily, but I did, you know, I was, I was able to play in that as well. Um, later this year or early next year, there's another project that I'm going to be a part of, which I can't speak about at the moment, um, which has just been put on hold because of because of the COVID situation. So there are things that are happening um, and hopefully, you know, touch wood, uh, things continue to happen. But you just, I guess you just don't know, Stefan, in this, in, you know, in this world, like what's going to happen? Do they like your face now or will they continue to in 10 years? Uh, Oh, yeah. <laughs> hope so. Yeah, it's kind of scary, but exciting, isn't it? I suppose it's one of those sort of professions, one of those jobs where, yeah, you just sort of you can never really second guess what's to come. But that that has its own pros and cons. <laughs> but, yeah, yeah, man. Like it's you know, I love what I do. It's it's scary, um, but you know, I'm I'm lucky. I'm able to hold down a day job where I work for this puzzle book company uh, called Any, Any Puzzle Media. I do some illustration stuff for them. So, you know, there's a there's a little bit of something to lean on um but i mean acting's acting's all i really know so so keep employing me people <laughs> well like, if, if this performance and character and movie is anything to go on i mean it should the role should come flooding in because i thought vikash i'm oh, sorry not vikash farhad <laughs> um was such a wonderful character and you brought so much humanity and depth to, to that role so i thought it was a, a great character and a great film so yeah yeah <laughs> oh, i appreciate that man thank you Stefan. that's that's kind of you say so dude Ladies and gentlemen, you're watching Hey You Guys! Hey You Guys, huh? Hey you guys, is yeah. that from the Goonies? It is indeed, yeah. Nice. Hey You Guys!